Good evening, everyone, and welcome to the University of Washington's uh, Sustaining Our Northwest World Seminar. My name is Bruce Baer. I'm Dean of the College of Forest Resources, and on behalf of the college, I want to welcome all of you to this 2008 winter lecture entitled Sustaining Our Northwest World, Rare Plant Conservation in the Pacific Northwest. Demographic, economic, and environmental forces are reshaping research and educational paradigms, and tonight's lecture is just one example of the work going on at the College of Forest Resources to sustain our Northwest world in the face of these changes. Programs in our college highlight the dynamic balance required to meet the growing natural resource needs of society while sustaining the environmental, economic, and cultural values we all associate with our region's urban and wildland resources. Our lecture tonight is a companion to the college's Denman Forestry Issues series, which is also seen on UWTV. And both that series and tonight's lecture contribute to the college's vision of world-class leadership in sustaining natural resources and environmental services throughout the region and beyond in order to improve the lives of future generations while satisfying the needs of people today. We are very pleased to present this lecture in partnership with the University of Washington Alumni Association. We are also grateful for the support of the Rachel A. Woods Endowment, which is underwriting a portion of this program, and to members of the Dean's Club for their financial support. I encourage all of you to contact us at our website, www.cfr.washington.edu, to explore the broad nature of re natural resource issues that we are studying and to learn how our college plans to educate the next generation of natural resource scientists and leaders while creating and leveraging new technology to sustain our Northwest world. Our lecture tonight will be presented by University of Washington College of Forest Resources Professor Sarah Reichert, who will discuss rare plant phenomena and identify new trends regionally, nationally, and globally involving the sustainability of plant life and how we can best conserve rare plants in our ecosystems. Professor Reichert, as director of the UW Botanic Gardens Rare Plant Conservation Program, seeks practical forms of conservation and develops applied scientific solutions through research involving the monitoring of rare plant populations, the impacts of invasive species, ways of detecting new bioinvasions, and new ways to think about the causes and probabilities of upcoming threats. Sarah's lecture is especially important in light of the ongoing discussion of the probable impacts of both human population growth and global climate change and their combined effects on the forest and plants of the Pacific Northwest. Suffice it to say that these probable impacts might seriously affect the sustainability of our forest and plants, at least as we know them today. Now it gives me great pleasure to introduce Sarah who will discuss these issues and again, the topic of Sarah's lecture is rare plant conservation in the Pacific Northwest. Sarah? Thank you, Dean Baer, and thanks to all of you for coming out tonight. Um, it's really great to see so many of you here. It's always a little bit intimidating to talk before the hometown crowd, uh, but I really appreciate you all coming out and hearing about rare plants in Washington State. Last October 15th, a group of people from the University of Washington, uh, faculty, staff, volunteers, people from the Seattle and Tacoma Garden Clubs, the Washington uh, Department of Natural Resources, and students from Central Washington University came together in a place called Camas Meadows in the Wenatchee Mountains. Why did we all come there on this cold, you know, clear, but cold day? What were we up to there? 
We were there because of this plant, Sedalsia oregana variety calva, or the Wenatchee checker mallow. This is a species that is federally listed as endangered under the Endangered Species Act. It was listed in 1999. It is one of the rarest species that we have here in Washington. It's a member of the, um, the family, uh, the, the cotton and hibiscus family. And it is, as I said, an extremely rare species. Uh, the Fish and Wildlife Service, which is the agency which is charged with um, monitoring and managing rare plants in the United States, has a scale of 1 to 18, by which they rate the rareness of species, with 1 being the most rare. This plant is labeled as a 3. So that gives you an indication of how rare the species is considered to be. There are remaining about five populations of this species, so it's very limited. Two of them are completely on private land, and under the Endangered Species Act, um, species that are listed that are on private land do not receive protection. Animals on private land do receive protection, plants do not. So these plants on, on the private lands are very vulnerable and really subject to the private landowner's concern for them. Uh, the largest population is 11,000 plants, which is Camas Meadows, where we were meeting, and it is a mixture of state and federal and private lands there. So to protect this species, it's really important that we maintain these few populations that we have, particularly the ones that are on public lands that we actually can protect. There are a number of threats that are causing this species to become endangered. Uh, chief among them, as with most species, as we're going to find out tonight, are habitat loss and degradation. And that's what our group was there to do. We were there to try and improve the habitat by planting native species that the Department of Natural Resources had propagated to try and establish a stronger uh, community for the Sedalsia to, to grow in. So that's why we all gathered there. That's why so many people came together for this species, was to try and improve the habitat for it. I have had a graduate student who has run research on this species, uh, Tara Zimmerman, and her research has also shown that there are some other threats as well. She found that it is pollinated by a number of different species, but primarily by a specialist pollinator, a native bee that specializes in sedalsias. And this is the only sedalsia in that area, so that bee is really dependent on having this sedalsia to visit. Um, there's really a close relationship between them. She also found that uh, policies of fire suppression are probably also affecting this species. Her, her data on how uh, this plant responded to fire was somewhat ambiguous in that it didn't respond negatively, but it didn't respond positively. But this is a fire-adapted ecosystem, and the suppression of fire is allowing the encroachment of invasive species into the community. So she did find that fire suppression was also an issue. But one of the biggest findings that she found was that of the four sites where she studied, the plant that only 17% of the seeds escaped predation by insects. Um, these, again, were mostly native insects that specialize in sedalsias. It's, a, it's a kind of a specialized world out there, apparently, with some of these species. So seed predation is a serious consideration for this species and for the protection of it. She found a lot of weevils investing these seeds. And you can see with the dark blue across the board where these bars are, these are the predated seeds. In most cases, they were completely predated. In some cases, the, the, the embryo was still there. And that might actually enhance the germination of the seed by cracking the seed coat but not harming the embryo. But in general, her recommendations to the Department of Natural Resources which manages a lot of this, is that they needed to manage the predator load on this, at the same time being very careful that in their uh, management of some insects, the predators, they aren't harming other insects, the pollinators. Unfortunately, this plant is not alone. This is from uh, some data that has been collected by the International Union for the Conservation of Nature, which is an organization out of Switzerland that tracks rare plant and animal species across the globe. They believe that about 12% of the plants in, on the globe are imperiled. They are in danger of becoming extinct. And you can see they've been tracking the data for only about 10 years, but there is a trend in all of the three different classes of vulnerable, uh, which is sort of the, the ones that they're just worried about, and then the endangered and critically endangered, there also are increases of those. Now, some of this is because they're assessing more species, they're getting more information to assess the species, but it is also true that species around the globe are facing increasing imperilment. So you may be wondering what's happening a little bit closer to home. Well, IUCN says that the United States, that 29% of our species, about 6,000 of our species, are imperiled. We are the fourth worst in the world. Now, you'd think that we are a pretty developed country and we're pretty smart about things here. The data don't say that that's true. 
So um, we're, we're not in a very good shape here in the United States. Now, the graph here shows you the species that are actually listed as endangered or threatened under the Endangered Species Act. So these are the ones that are receiving federal protection and federal monies. And uh, you get the idea that it's not quite 6,000 species here. In fact, only about 5% of the species that need to be protected are actually being protected right now under the Endangered Species Act. I also want you to note under the listed species that the green bar, which represents the plants, is bigger than the, uh, the, the orange bar, reddish orange bar, that represents the animals. So there are more plants than animals that are listed. Despite that, when we look at the amount of money that is allocated to the protection of rare plant species, it's not a pretty picture. So this is from some, um, some data that the Fish and Wildlife Service had and gave to the Bureau of Land Management. And this tracks the, uh, the amount of money that state and federal agencies are reporting that they are spending on the protection of rare species, not including land acquisitions. And uh, tracking it from 1999 to 2004. And if you look at the upper line with the, the green and uh, with the yellow, you'll see that um, it's, it's increasing. There was that little dip in 2003. But in general, the amount of money that we're allocating to the protection of plants and animals is increasing in this country. But where are the plants? Oh, look, that's the green line way at the bottom there. That's the amount of money that's being allocated to the protection of plants that are listed under the Federal Endangered Species Act. Um, the lowest was in, uh, the highest was in 2000 when a little bit um, over 5% of the total money being spent on these species was on plants. The lowest was 2004 when it was less than 3% of the money that's allocated to the protection of listed species in this country were going towards plants. Now some of you are probably thinking, ah yes, but it must be much easier to try and work with plants than with animals. And in some cases that's true, in other cases it's not. Some of these plants are very challenging to work with, they're hard to propagate, we don't have very much information as you're going to see from some of the research that we're talking about, from Tara's research. Those are the species we know a lot about. Most of them we know nothing about what the threats are, what they need to help them recover. This is a very, very serious problem. What about here in Washington? Let's narrow it in a little bit more. This talk is about protecting and conserving Washington's rare plants. In this state, the uh, D Department of Natural Resources Natural Heritage Program is charged with monitoring and, and managing and maintaining data on the rare plant populations in this state. There are about 322 right now on the current list that they're tracking. Um, you can see the total list here and the number that they have spread out is endangered, threatened, sensitive, or extinct. These are the species that they are tracking and are concerned about. Um, it's important to note that we do not in the state have an endangered species law, so all of this is just advisory. All of the species that, that the Heritage Program has said, these are what these categories are, these are for the state and federal and private people that want to manage them to understand where their species fall in the, um, in the, in the order of things, but it's advisory and it really doesn't provide any protection, it just provides us with a little bit of knowledge. Okay, I've been throwing out some terms, and so academics always like to define things, and I had to resist the temptation to start out with definitions. Um, but I want to define a couple terms for us now and back up a little bit. First of all, I've been tossing out this word rare. What does that mean? Uh, that is a biological term. Um, biologists argue about it, what it means, as only scientists can argue about small minutia uh, and differences. And, um, and it basically comes down to, when we talk about rareness, we're talking about it in the context of these three things. First of all, the abundance or the sheer number of individual plants or populations and populations of plants. And a population is simply a number of individuals in the same species that are occurring in an area where they are actually or potentially interbreeding. So they're the same species growing fairly geographically close to each other. So we want to know what are the numbers of the individuals and the populations. We want to know the range um, size and the extent of the populations. So is it found only on the Olympic Peninsula or is it found throughout the West Coast? All of those things make a difference in how we look at the rarity of these species. And then the last one is kind of an important one. It's um, the habitat specificity for climate and geology. And this is a chance for me to remind you and to remind myself that some species are naturally rare. So when we're talking about rare species, sometimes we're talking about species that just are not going to occur in large numbers. And the geology is a great case in point because some species, plant species are very specific to the types of soil and nutrition that they need, and they will only grow where those conditions are right. A great example here in Washington are plants that grow in serpentine soils. 
Serpentine soils have a, a low calcium to magnesium ratio and some other interesting soil chemistry uh, aspects to them. Plants that can grow on those soils are very specific to those serpentine soils. We don't have a lot of serpentine soils, so the plants that are specific to those soils are not going to be very widespread. They're going to be naturally rare. That doesn't mean that we are actually imperiling them or that something is happening to them. So then I want to talk about imperiled plants, because when most of what we talk about and we think about when we're talking about rarity, and certainly what I think about, is, is basically imperiled plants. And these are plants that are vulnerable to extinction due to very low population numbers or serious threats to the populations. And those are the ones that we really are worried about. They're what, not the ones that are just naturally rare. These are the ones that we are really in danger of losing that could become very extinct. So as I use these terms, kind of keep these things in mind. Okay, how do these things get to be imperiled? Um, basically, in most cases, I'm sorry to say, it is us. It's human beings that are doing this. Um, we, in this extinction crisis, we are the problem here. This is, uh, the graph shows you uh, some work that David Wilkove and his colleagues de did a number of years ago. They went through the U.S. Federal Register. The U.S. Federal Register is a legal document that's produced by the federal government. And every time the, the, the uh, uh, Fish and Wildlife Service is proposing to list a species as endangered under the Endangered Species Act, they publish an account in the Federal Register. So what David and his associates did was they went through all of these accounts for plants, and there were a little over a thousand of them that they went through, and they said, why do the scientists think these plants are imperiled? What's going on? Well, unfortunately, plants can be imperiled for, by a number of things, and so you'll notice that this does add up to more than 100% if you add up all these bars. But this is what they came up with. And basically what they found is that in plants, at least, not so much always in animals, but in plants, the three main causes of imperilment are habitat destruction and loss, non-native and invasive species, and over-harvest. Okay, so this is what's causing most of the problems here. And I want to take those three and just go over them in a little bit more depth so that you understand what I'm talking about. So losing habitat, that's, it's pretty easy to see that we're losing habitat. Uh, we're building cities, houses, uh, businesses, shopping centers. All of these things are um, impacting. All of these places were habitat for plants and animals before we got here and built on them. So habitat destruction is pretty easy to grasp. Um, the, the photograph on your right-hand side is a, NASA, um, a photograph taken by a NASA satellite recently, and it gives you the idea of the amount of development in the Puget Sound area. Uh, when you contrast that with the one on the left, which was um, taken by satellites in 1851 when the human population... For, okay, I can't pull that one off on you. You guys figured that one out. So it wasn't Lake Taps and the Ship Canal that, that's, that got you on that one, huh? Okay, all right, I lied. There, aren't actually, there weren't actually satellites in 1851. This was done by Methune Architects, and I love the slide, so they gave it to me. But I, I think it really sort of graphically shows you the impact that we've had in a very short period of time here in um, the Puget Sound area. We've gone from essentially what you see here on the left to what you see here on the right. Um, in a very short period of time, and that's really had a, a pretty big impact on species. I also like the slide on the right, because if you look at it, you see, yes, all the white stuff is development, and we, there's a lot of it. There's also a lot of green stuff in there, little patches of green in among all the white. So that brings to another type of habitat degradation, and that is habitat fragmentation. So the first slide shows you up on top, you've got a nice stretch of green. Let's say that's a nice forest here in the Pacific Northwest. And we drop a city down in the middle of that forest, and the forest gets split into two parts. So we fragmented that forest now. So those two parts, they can't be gene flow. There can't be pollination occurring. There can't be seed dispersal because there's a city sitting in the middle of them. So these populations become very isolated. They may become so isolated that they can't actually um, sustain themselves, that they can't, they will actually become, those populations will go extinct. Uh, they may begin to um, evolve very differently to different selection pressures. Um, so that's an idea of fragmentation. It's actually not really how it happens. How it really happens, cities don't come out of the sky and fall on a forest. Um, we actually build in them very slowly. And so the slide, the, the picture down below, really explains the situation probably a little bit better. If you look at the lower portion of it that's all green, let's think of that as, Central Puget Sound, okay, in 1851. So we came in and we started developing Tacoma and Seattle and Everett. And so think of those in the next one up as the little yellow uh, blobs. Those are the cities. And we've, still got, we've got the cities, they're developing, but we still have lots of green, lots of forest and habitat around them. 
We get to the situation that we're getting to today that that satellite uh, photograph really illustrated is that we're coalescing, the cities are coalescing, and now instead of having little pockets of development, we've got little tiny pockets of habitat that are highly fragmented and se separated from each other. And this is the situation that we have going he on here in the Puget Sound area and throughout the world, really. It was this incredible habitat fragmentation where the species really just are not able to, to flow, have genes flow between them like they used to. Okay, um, many of you know that I do a lot of work on invasive species. Um, and we are finding that invasive species really are having a lot of impacts on rare species and on native species, and we're just beginning to unravel them. Um, some of our students in the College of Forest Resources and the University of Washington Botanic Gardens, like Dean Doherty and Bronwyn Scott, have worked on nitrogen-fixing species like Scotch broom and gorse. And what they found is that these species really do change the soil chemistry. And they change it, the, the older the stand is, the more the soil chemistry is changed. And it's not a simple matter of going in and removing these species and everything returning to normal. That soil chemistry is changed for long periods of time. So we can't just think that we're going to go in, remove the species, plant some Douglas firs and some native plants, and everything's going to go back to normal. It's not that simple. We're finding these, all these cascade effects. Um, Jennifer Leach, another graduate student in our program, worked on butterfly bush and found that the roots, uh, where it grows, it's invading along rivers, the roots really hold the river in place, and they're changing the, the river dynamics. The river isn't moving like it should. And I also, I'm a plant person, so I always want to talk about the plants, but some of the non-native invasive species that are really impacting our native species are not plants. They're things like pathogens, uh, fungi and insects and bacteria that are causing diseases in plants. They're insects, such as the Asian and the European gypsy moth that you see in the, in the photograph here. Um, so far, we don't have established populations of either species here in Washington, but we've detected both species, and the Department of Agriculture has been very aggressive about getting out there and taking care of them. We have other insects that are already here and others that are on their way um, coming here. So these are a very serious impact to native species. And there's over-harvest. And I chose a, 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 to illustrate this, an, a, a non-Washington example, simply because this one is so well studied. There are a lot of really good uh, data on this one. Um, so this is, is ginseng, which, as probably most of you know, has a lot of medical uses. Um, anything that is in the genus Panax is considered to be ginseng and has these properties, and people probably associate it with Asian medicine, but we actually do have an American ginseng species that's on the East Coast, um, and is fairly co was fairly common there, actually, a common under forest understory species. Um, you can farm ginseng and grow perfectly good ginseng, but it doesn't have the properties that are highly desired by the people that want it for medical use, um, mostly people in Asia, I think that they're really doing a lot of, of exporting of it. Um, so they're going out and harvesting it. And they can make a lot of money harvesting it. Because these wild collected roots are so valuable, in West Virginia, they can make $500 a pound off of the ginseng roots. That's a lot of money. It's a $6 million a year business in West Virginia. And this is a country that economic studies last year showed using a number of economic indicators. They're kind of at the bottom of the economy in the United States. So if somebody can make $500 a pound going out there and collecting these roots out of the forest, and that's what's going to feed their family, they're going to go out there and do it. So overharvest is a big deal with ginseng. But there are other species that we have here in Washington that are also being harvested. Uh, orchids in particular, people like to collect orchids. Uh, cacti are another one that throughout the, the American West is a real problem with overharvest. People collecting cacti and orchids and other species for ornamental use. Um, and um, it's, it's a serious concern. It's a serious enough concern that our, when we train our monitors in the rare care program, they have to sign something saying they will not release the location or not tell anybody about the location of the population that they're assigned to. Even if it's not something flashy like an orchid, there are collectors out there for almost everything. And, uh, and we really worry that we're increasing the vulnerability of the species by even telling people where they are. So overharvest is a very serious problem. OK, so we've talked about you know, what's going on and all. Why should we care about this, really? I mean, so what? A few more species go extinct. Extinctions happen. We've had, you know, this is the fifth extinction spasm that we've had. We've had four more before. Why care? So I want to address that a little bit. And I think it's a very personal thing, is why, why care is personal to each one of us. Um, but you know, this is what they said in the Endangered Species Act, that these plants have aesthetic, ecological, educational, historical, recreational, and scientific value to the nation and its people. Absolutely true. Kind of dry. 
though. Um, so I thought I'd give you a couple of examples that maybe, you know, make it more personal to you. So the photograph on the right there is the rosy periwinkle, and this is one of the classic cases that we hold up on uh, why, these, why care, because these plants may have compounds that are valuable to us. So the rosy periwinkle is native to Madagascar, um, an island off the, the coast of um, Africa, and it has a lot of compounds in the, the plant that have a lot of medical uses. Um, they've found that they're good for many things, but not the least of which is that they have increased the survivorship of childhood leukemia from 10% to 95%. Okay? So that's a pretty useful plant for us. I think we can all agree on that one. Um, this plant can easily be farmed, and so they are har farming it. It's not being harvested. It is being farmed. But the point I want to make with this is Madagascar is a very poor country, and it practices slash and burn agriculture. And um, this plant grows in the forests, and if these compounds had not been derived before this plant had, before the forests were destroyed, we wouldn't have that plant that has been so useful for treating childhood leukemia. So we need to conserve these species, if not the least of which, it may cure horrible diseases that we have in human populations. The, plant, the, the slide on the, on the left there, of course, is our own sort of poster child for this, and probably many of you people recognize uh, Texas brevifolia, or the, uh, the western yew. Uh, this plant is a forest tree, very common in uh, Washington, not considered to be a very valuable tree for the most part. You couldn't do a lot with it, and so people really weren't that interested in it. Um, until the 70s, when somebody realized that there was a chemical that could be derived from the bark called taxol that was very useful. And it wasn't, that it was actually discovered in the 70s, but it wasn't until the 80s that people really picked up on it, when it was found to be very effective in, in treating ovarian cancer. Since then, it's been found very effective in treating um, brain cancer and lung cancer and all kinds of other tumor cancers as well as some leukemias. So a very, very useful plant considered to be completely unimportant in Northwest forests, really just not on people's radar at all. Turns out that it's got amazing chemicals in it. In fact, we became concerned about it because people started going out and harvesting the bark, which then kills the trees. And we were starting to get a little bit worried about this once common species not being so common. Uh, but fortunately, they have found out a way to synthesize taxol, so that's not an issue anymore. So the point here is that these plants really could be very beneficial to us, and maybe we should just keep them until we know something else. Okay, so that's one reason. Another reason is that we just don't understand community complexity. So we get a lot from the forests and from the, the native plant uh, communities in our midst. We get clean air, we get clean water, we get a lot of services from them. And the reality is, is that we don't understand how these systems work. Now we have a great ecologist in the College of Forest Resources who are out there every day trying to unravel the, this complexity of how these species, these plant and animal species, interact. But it's very, very complicated, and we'll probably never fully understand it. And it's not something where you could just go and say, okay, we got lots of Douglas fir, therefore it's the most important species in this forest. Not necessarily so. It might be the mycorrhizal fungi in the soil that allow that plant to take up water and nutrients. It might be an insect that pollinates something that produces fruit that's critical for some animal that maintains other parts of those ecosystems. So we don't know what the parts are that are important, and we'd better keep them because we need these forests. Okay, so that's another reason. But here's the reason that works for me. We're the ones that are messing stuff up, and we have a responsibility to be stewards. We have a responsibility to try and fix what we're messing up. So this, is a, this slide shows you some, um, some volunteers from the University of Washington and other agencies. There's DNR and Fish and Wildlife. They're out at Evie's Landing on um, Whidbey Island, planting out Castilea lavasecta, the golden paintbrush. This is another one of our uh, federally listed species in this state. And it, is, um, it used to be pretty widespread. And we built a lot of houses and shopping malls on it. And now it's down to just 11 or 12 populations. And so we were out there trying to establish some new populations adjacent to another population. This is, an, to me, a, a, just an important thing, is that we need to be part of the solution on this. So that gets to rare care, okay, which Dean Baer referred to. So in 1999, I looked around the state, and uh, my husband and I have been backpackers and hikers for a long time, and we've seen what's going on. We've seen what's happening in East King County with all the development, and I could see that there were some problems. And I also looked around the state, and I said, there are no university programs, there are no botanic garden programs, there are no people with botanical expertise that are helping these stretched agencies. The federal and state agencies, like the Fish and Wildlife Service and the Natural Heritage Program, do not have the resources that they need. And we maybe could help them. We have expertise, we have facilities, we have access to funding that they may not have access to. 
So I founded the Rare Care Program in 1999 here at the University of Washington. It is part of the University of Washington Botanic Gardens, and it is, at this point at least, focused exclusively on plants that are designated as rare by the Heritage Program in Washington State. Um, we named it the Rare Plant Care and Conservation Program. This was actually two graduate students at, uh, affiliated with the University of Washington Botanic Gardens who came up with the name. I held a contest, and they came up with the name and the logo. So it, uh, I was being told the Bullet Foundation uh, provided us with the seed money for this, and they told me I needed a snappy name. Um, I, I had some really boring name. I don't even remember what it was for. It was very long and boring. And they said, you need something snappy. And so the graduate students came up with Rare Care for short, or rare plant care and conservation. And you know, so it's rare care. You may not like it, but you're going to remember it. And you're going to know what we do. We care for the rare. So it works on all those <laughs> levels. Uh, and so our mission is that we are dedicated to conserving Washington's native rare plants through methods including ex situ conservation, and I'll define that in a minute, rare plant monitoring, reintroduction, and education. So that's what we do. We are proud members of the Center for Plant Conservation. This is a, a network of now more than 30 botanical gardens in Arboretum, really. Um, it was founded in 1984, and it is currently based at the Missouri Botanic Garden in St. Louis. It is a wonderful group of colleagues to have around the country. We have the National Collection of Endangered Plants, and this is, uh, for those of you who are familiar with, with zoos and their species, um, I forget what they're calling them, but they we have uh, different zoos that work to, to protect different species and they collaborate on them. We essentially have that with the National Collection. We've looked around the country at the rare plants and we sort of divvy them up as to who's going to work on what and who's going to focus on what. But more than that, it's just having this great network of wonderful colleagues across the, the country that we can get inspiration from and information from and share res resources. So we have four, our programs basically fall into four different areas. There's research, of course. Um, there's ex situ conservation. Now, ex situ is a Latin term that means off-site. So that's all that ex situ means. And it means that we're doing the conservation off the site where the, the rare plants occur. In our case, we're really concentrating on seed banking, and I'll talk more about that. Um, we do in situ conservation, so that's on-site conservation. And of course, much of the research is on-site conservation. But we also have a program in monitoring rare plant populations. And then we also have a fairly limited, but a, a good program in outreach and education. So I've already talked to you about Tara's research um, on the, the checker mallow. I want to talk about just a few other things, uh, just a few of the research projects that we've had going. So uh, Silene celii is a plant in the carnation family. It occurs near Leavenworth, and it occurs mostly on rock cliffs. Um, those of you that have been to Leavenworth and looked at those rock cliffs may have noticed people climbing up and down them. It's a very popular area for recreational rock climbers. And the Forest Service, who owns most of the land where this plant occurs, was very concerned that these rock climbers were having an impact on the species, that they were essentially grooming the, the cracks where these species grow and pulling plants out, gardening them, if you will, and weeding, um, so that they could put their, their fingers and their toes into these cracks. So Devin Malkin, one of my graduate students, took on this project. And um, what he found was that it did look like the, re the recreational rock climbers were actually having an impact on the climbed faces, that he did find fewer plants on the climbed faces. But fortunately, in the course of his work, he did find lots of unclimbable faces that had lots of plants on them, pl uh, places that were too crumbly for people to, to climb and things, as well as rock scree, sort of piles of rocks that had the plant growing in it. So he was able to conclude from that and to reassure the Forest Service that, yeah, they did have a little bit of a problem with the rock climbing, but overall the species was secure on their land. The showy stick seed is one that we've been working on for a while. Um, Hakelia venusta is federally listed as endangered. And it is one of Washington's rarest species. It's essentially down to one population. And the, popu the, the place where the population grows is um, pretty much what you see there on the, the lower slide. Very steep, very rocky, very dangerous to work in, uh, dangerous for humans and also dangerous for the plants because they get stepped on. It's a very challenging place to work. Now, it was thought that this plant did not propagate well from seed and that if we were going to establish new populations of it, that we would need to um, be able to um, tissue culture it. Okay, so we were asked by the Fish and Wildlife Service to investigate how you tissue culture this plant. So tissue culture is when you take a little bit of tissue, in this case it's stem tissue, and you put it on a medium that's a lot like jelly that has uh, nutrients in it and hormones, plant hormones in it. And what you first do is you get it to form little shoots, little leaves, and then you divide that up 
and you put it on a different jelly that has different hormones that makes it form roots. And so you essentially get little plants growing in jelly. And then you can take them out and plant them in soil. So we worked on this for quite a while, and we did figure out how to do it. Um, it's really difficult with this plant, and what we found was that some genotypes, some mother plants, took to cloning like that. They just, they, you know, we could repopulate the world with some of those clones, but it wasn't very many of them. A lot of the clones, we just couldn't get them to take at all. And that's not what you want. When you reintroduce a rare plant, you want to have as much genetic diversity as possible. You don't want to have just one or two mother plants, because if there's some sort of environmental change, there's going to be less adaptation in that population. There were other issues with tissue culture as well. So we decided we were going to abandon tissue culture. And in walked Jeannie Taylor, who's one of my graduate students, who's here somewhere, because I know I saw her earlier. She's right there. And, uh, and Jeannie has been working on this plant and looking at reproductive biology issues. And what she has found is that you can actually germinate the seeds, um, that it just takes a long time to germinate them. But she was getting pretty good, about 50% germination, which is not bad, actually. It doesn't sound that great, but it's actually not bad for most plants. Um, and what she's done is move them through different temperature conditions. So she's, they start out warm, they go cold, they go warm, they go cold. And by running them through these, these she actually gets pretty good germination. So that means that we actually can use the seed to reproduce these species. It's much less expensive and much less bother than tissue culture. And it also is going to give us more genetic representation. So that was great. She also has found that the plant does require pollination. There was some concern that it wasn't producing enough seed because there weren't pollinators present. Um, and that it was, had, had pollen issues. But what she's found is that it actually um, does require pollination, but there are a number of things out there that are visiting it and presumably pollinating it. And so it actually is producing seeds pretty well. And that, again, gives the Forest Service, who owns this land, good information on how to manage them and how to plan for reestablishing new populations. Now, Julie Combs, who's also in the audience, has been working on Astragalus sinuatus. Um, this is a plant species that's just found in a small part of eastern Washington on some public land, um, BLM and Department of Natural Resources land. And, um, and a little bit of private land, um, is, it's being impacted by, by some private lands. And what she has found is that um, she, there's a co-occurring astragalus in there. And she found that there were more herbivores on the rare species. And this is actually, this was her master's work. This has actually spurred the PhD work that she's working on right now, is looking at these comparisons of, of rare and common species of astragalus and the herbivory on them. She found that removing the herbivores did increase the seeds. So it does look like the herbivores are impacting the number of seeds that are getting out to replenish the population. And then she came up with something that I just thought was so brilliant. She came into my office one day, and she was taking a class in uh, plant protection, and she learned about boll weevils. And boll weevils are a, a weevil, a pest of cotton fields in the American South. And they overwinter in grass around the fields. And um, Julie came in and she said, what if that's what's going on here? Because it's a little bit hard to see, but in that upper slide there, uh, there's a lot of grass in the background. And that is an introduced invasive grass, cheat grass, or bromus tectorum. And she said, what if the bromus tectorum is doing the same thing with these weevils and insects that are predating the astragalus sinuatus. So she did a thatch removal experiment, and she did find that there was some evidence that having the grass there um, was impacting the species, and it increased seedling health when the th that was removed. That gives the landowners very good information on how to manage the species to decrease the rarity. So those are just a few examples of the research that's gone on and the kind of information that the program is providing to landowners. I want to move now to the XC2 conservation or the Miller Seed Vault. This has really become the, um, the, the central point of our whole program. Um, you may have heard about seed vaults recently. There's a, a big one going in in a remote area of Norway right now. And the idea is that you know, in case of world catastrophes, we're going to have all of the species or agricultural species and important native species banked way up there in Norway, which hopefully won't get blown up or whatever is going to happen to us. Um, you may have also heard about the Millennium Seed Vault at the Royal Botanic Garden of Kew has gotten a lot of press. Uh, we do have a, a big seed vault here in this country in Fort Collins. It's run by the, the US Department of Agriculture. But you probably didn't know that we have a pretty cool seed vault right here at the University of Washington. Um, the Miller Seed Vault uh, opened in summer 2003. This was a very generous gift from the Miller Charitable Trust, and they continue to fund the operation of it. We're very, very grateful for that. Uh, what, what this is, is um, it's, it's very unique. We only know of one other seed vault 
like this at a university or, or public garden. That's down at the Berry Botanic Garden, um, which has a, a very good seed vault, but it's smaller in size than ours. Ours is 150 square feet of space. We have four-hour firewalls. Most of the CPC gardens that are doing seed banking are storing their seeds in a refrigerator. And we all know that refrigerators are not terribly secure. So if there is a fire, all the seeds that are banked and then all that important genetic material is lost. So we have four-hour firewalls. We have a prep and drying room. So the prep room is what you see here in the photograph. This is essentially the lab area where we actually process seeds and, um, and store them and count them, and, and not count, store them, but count them and get them ready for storage. Uh, what you don't see is just, if we were to continue on just to the right of that, there is another room, there's a door, and you go into another room that's slightly larger, and that is another storage room where we can dry the seeds down and store seeds for a shorter period of time for things like restoration work. Um, all of this is climate controlled with low temperature, which makes it a very popular place in the summertime and very unpopular this time of year, um, and very low relative humidity. So if you're in there moving around and sweating, you won't actually be sweating because it's evaporating off. Um, that's, that's great, low, low, low uh, relative humidity. That's actually one of the most important things about storing seeds is not the temperature but keeping the humidity low. We also do have long-term uh, cold storage in the chest freezer that you see here. And our mission is to collect and store seeds of all of Washington's native rare plants as a resource for restoration, reintroduction, and research. That's pretty ambitious. Um, I already said there's a lot of native plants populations out there. So trying to get all of them in there is going to be a lot of work. Um, we're working hard on it. And, um, and the other thing, too, is that seeds only remain viable for so long, even when they're stored under perfect conditions. So we have to continually test the species to see if they're becoming inviable so we can go out and recollect. So far, we have collected um, about 65 populations in 50 species with about 2,100 accessions. Now, we do what's called collecting along maternal lines, which means that each mother plant is an accession. So whether we collect one seed or 200 from one mother plant, that is an accession for us. Okay, so we collect along maternal lines. Um, at our last science advisors meeting, one of our science advisors sort of jokingly said that we were being speciesist that we were only collecting plants of, uh, that had seeds. And we said, well, you can't store spores. You know, spores for things like ferns and things. There's no endosperm, you can't store them. Well, it turns out I was reading a paper and it says that there are some kinds of, of spore-bearing spore species that you can store under the same conditions we have in the seed vault. So Wendy Gibble, who is the rare care pro uh, program manager and an undergraduate, have been exploring this and we may start storing spores in the future. We've trained 27 collect seed collecting volunteers some of you probably out here, I'm not sure exactly who's here, but we probably have some seed collecting volunteers here. Uh, we also have about 12 to 15 people who are trained in processing the seeds, and I think this is Eve Dixon, and Eve's actually here too. She's another one of our volunteers. Um, and we have three incubation chambers for germination studies, like the one that Jeannie did, and they're each set at different temperatures so we can move seeds through them, as well as for the viability testing. And most rare species, we don't even know how to propagate them, and so we're just experimenting with how to propagate these species. I, I should note that we actually need five incubators to properly do this, so if anyone is interested in donating an incubator to the Rare Care Program, talk to me. We would be happy to, um, to set you up with that. So, um, so that's the seed vault. I want to turn now to the rare plant monitoring. Um, this is a very close partnership with the Washington Natural Heritage Program, the agency that tracks the rare plants in Washington. We select the populations that we monitor from their database, and we work very closely with them in identifying the populations that they think need monitoring most. Uh, we also work very carefully to uh, select our volunteers. So we have a great volunteer group. We don't just take anybody, we, we want people that have proven their, their dedication by additional education or work experience working in biology, horticulture, something related to you know, biology. We do check references on them, we take this very seriously because we're giving them privileged information. And we do train them, they have to, they, it's mandatory that they go through a training process in which we um, tell them what we want them to do. Uh, Laura Zibis, who was the first program manager for Rare Care, uh, put together a quality assurance protocol and we follow that to make sure that all of the data that we collect and that we're giving to the heritage program and the landowners is good quality data. We also provide additional training and plant ID for those that want it and navigation and the last, the latter one, the navigation is in uh, partnership with the Mountaineers organization. It's been a lot of fun. 
So how have we been doing on that? We have monitored over 400 rare plant populations representing over 200 species, and we found 25 previously unknown populations. Now, this is pretty significant, and, and it's also important to remember that one of the reasons that we started doing this was because the Heritage Program was reporting that, on average, rare plant populations in this state, the you know, random rare plant population that you choose, is only getting visited by a professional botanist once every 10 years. So by having all of these volunteers out there and doing all of this, we are really leveraging the amount of information that they have about these rare plant populations. We also last year did something for the first time that was really fun. We went out and did a monitoring as a group. So Erythron basalticus is in the daisy family. It uh, occurs only on very steep basalt rock cliffs near Yakima. And so we convened 13 volunteers there. Um, it's a little bit tricky to monitor something that's on a steep cliff because uh, you can't actually walk up to it. So the top slide, you see uh, all of us training on how we're going to do the monitoring. We use binoculars. We learned to identify the species. We figured out how we're going to sample using binoculars because sometimes the population was too large for us to count every single one. And so we needed to be able to, to do a samples of them. So um, we went out there and we found um, that the known populations look pretty stable and secure for the most part. Uh, people aren't building too many shopping malls on vertical basalt cliffs. So uh, they looked pretty good. And then the data were consistent with previous monitoring efforts. It wasn't too wildly off. And so we concluded that they were pretty secure. We also found two new populations. And because of this, the Fish and Wildlife Service, this was a candidate for listing as an endangered species. The Fish and Wildlife Service removed this species from the candidate list so that they could focus on other species which are not as stable as this. OK, what happens to all this monitoring data? So it starts out with the rare care volunteers. They go out and they monitor the rare plant populations. They fill out really long forms. This is a part, big part of their training is just how you fill out a form. Um, they get sent to the rare care office and to Jennifer Youngman, who probably has to do most of the, the sorting work with this. She copies them. We keep a copy of the report, but we send a copy to the Heritage Program for them to enter into their database. That also then goes to NatureServe, which is an organization that uh, manages um, information about uh, native plants and animals, which then ultimately can go to researchers. Another copy also goes to the landowners and the land managers. And we mo work mostly with state and federal agencies uh, that own the land. Um, and just you see the logos of just a few of our, our partners here that we work with. So this is what happens with all of the data. So it's very dynamic. It doesn't just come sit in our office. It goes right back out and helps people manage those populations. So this was a popular uh, program, and we were very honored in 2003 to win a National Award of Conservation Project of the Year from, it's a joint award, from the Bureau of Land Management and the U.S. Forest Service. And you can see in the, in the photograph that's Carolyn Alfano, who was the manager of Rare Care at the time, with Kathleen Clark, the head of BLM, and Dale Bosworth from the Forest Service giving her that award. And I think the nominating papers said something I, that I thought was really great. We had nothing to do with this. They did this. Rare Care has demonstrated a unique approach to harness the energy and interest of volunteers to help in native plant conservation. The volunteer program is the backbone of their conservation efforts. And that is just so true. On any given day, especially in the summer, especially on the weekends, you can go to any part of Washington state and you will find our volunteers out there all across the state monitoring rare plant populations, out there active people. At this point, I would like to ask all of the, the past and present rare care volunteers that are here, as well as the staff and the graduate students who are affiliated with the program to stand. I'm going to put you on the spot. I know there's a lot of you out there, so. Thanks, you guys. You really are the best, and you really are the backbone of the, the whole program, and we could not do it without you. Now, I mentioned we also do have some outreach programs. We have something called Celebrating Wildflowers. This is a national program that was started by the Forest Service, but in, I think, 2001, we were asked to take it over by the, the local Forest Service because they had lost funding and could no longer do it. Now, the idea with this is it's not necessarily focused on rare species, but it's about um, just getting people excited about plants and about native plants. There's a concept called plant blindness that says that most people, when they look at a plant, they see a green blob. And so we want them to not see a green blob. We want them to actually see the plants and care about them because then maybe they'll, help about, help, they'll care about conserving them. So we started doing this uh, in partnership with the Woodland Park Zoo. We did it for four years with them. It was a fabulous partnership. We loved their, our closest sister cultural institution in the city, and we loved working with them. 
But after four years, we began to feel like that we, there were some conflicts. First of all, people pay to get into the zoo, and that means that they have an investment, and that means that they have an agenda for the most part. So parents come in there, and they, you know, they want their kids to see the animals. And we want the kids to see the plants. And so every year we would run into the situation where some parent would be pulling the kid away, saying, Johnny, let's go look at the lions. And Johnny would be saying, no, I want to look at moss. And, uh, and so that's what you see in the top here. And, hey, I'm telling you the truth. People really do want to look at moss. And, and Lee Ellis is the moss lady. She's out here. So don't hear, let her hear you laughing here. That's her in the slide up there. Um, and, and we thought, yeah, Johnny should get to look at the moss. He shouldn't have to go look at the lion. So, um, so even though we loved our partnership with the zoo, we decided last year to go to the Olympic Sculpture Park. And it's free. The, um, the art just sits there. It doesn't roar. You know, we're, it's, it's not as hard to compete with it. And it, it was a lot of fun. And so this year, we're doing it again. It's going to be June at the Olympic Sculpture Park. I hope all of you will come out. Feel free to volunteer to help. It's a lot of work, but a lot of fun. And we're all exhausted at the end of the day, but with big smiles. Uh, bring, if you don't want to volunteer, come out and join us. Bring your kids and your grandkids. There's activities for all ages, and it's totally fun. OK, so let's talk about the future, OK? Because the future, we're facing some new threats. We're facing some of the old threats. So one of the biggest threats is, again, habitat loss. And the human population in Washington, according to the Census Bureau, between 2000 and 2030 is going to increase by 46%. 46%, that's a lot in 30 years. And all those people need to live somewhere, they need to work somewhere, they need to shop somewhere, they need to recreate somewhere. So um, we need to manage really carefully how we grow in this state. This is really a critical time for us. Another uh, problem that we've got coming in the future are biofuels. Now, most people think of biofuels as this wonderful green thing. And you know, certainly, we need to be dealing with our gasoline consumption. And biofuels are one option to do that. We have the 20 and 10 initiative, um, the energy initiative, which says that we need to cut our gasoline consumption by 20% in 10 years, mostly through the use of alternative fuels. Um, sounds great, except that most of the biofuel material that they're looking at are invasive species. So we're looking at the, the increasing spread of invasive species. And I've got to tell you, global meetings on invasive species, number one topic, biofuels. People are really freaked out. So in the, the top slide there, you see Arundo donax. This is um, a plant that's very invasive in California. Uh, it is being grown experimentally here in Washington for biofuels, and we're very concerned about it. In the lower slide, you see Johnson grass. This is a plant that we have known has been an agricultural weed for decades. In fact, little known fact, my mother did her PhD dissertation at LSU in the 1950s on the reproductive biology of Johnson grass in agricultural settings. So we've known for a long time this is a problem weed, but it's being investigated for use as biofuels. We need to be at the table. We need all the stakeholders there at the table saying, biofuels great, invasive species bad. When you start growing it in mass like this and the increased numbers that you saw in that previous graph, we're talking about increased propagule pressure. That means that we've got a lot more plants out there, and the chances that those plants are going to land in a safe site and begin to grow increases. So we need to be aware of this. Another alternative uh, fuel or energy source are wind farms. Uh, wind farms can be a great way to, to, get to generate electricity. They're expanding very rapidly in eastern Washington. Um, there's a lot of concern about them, and the Department of Fish and Wildlife does have guidelines, um, mostly to deal with wildlife, especially birds, because apparently birds and these wind farms don't mix well. Um, but the, and, the, and the guidelines also do recommend that they're, um, they, do plant, they do surveys for rare plants. But most of these wind farms are on private land. And again, remember that plants really are not protected on private land. So we need to be talking to these landowners, getting them. They just don't have to be incompatible. These can be compatible. Uh, the wind farms can work with plant conservation, but we need to get them on board. We need to find ways to and have incentives for them to try and protect the rare plant species. And then the elephant in the room is always climate change, isn't it? Um, we know that distributions are going to be shifting for plants. That some plants will be shifting northward in latitude. The ones who are really in trouble are the ones that are in the mountains, the alpine species because they normally would go up in elevation, but they can only go up so far. So we are working with the Park Service and the Forest Service and BLM to try and bank seeds of alpine species as much as possible. We may end up having to do some human-assisted migration, essentially taking these plants and, and taking them to farther uh, latitudes. OK, so 
by now I've dumped a lot of information on you. You're kind of overwhelmed. Um, so let's get down to some things that you guys can do here. First of all, um, you can learn about your native flora and be informed. And the great way to do that is to join the Washington Native Plant Society, WNPS.org. Uh, great hikes, great people, great lectures, great reading material. I strongly encourage, if you're not a member of WNPS, that you join. Volunteer for local activities, including rare care. We do have monitoring training up, uh, coming up in Seattle and Wenatchee, and we also have seed collecting training coming up. You can learn about invasive species and avoid using them in your garden. Um, this actually is what I talk about a lot. I go all over the world talking about this. Um, I haven't really talked about it very much here in Seattle, so subject for another lecture, but there's a lot of good things that are going on in helping us avoid invasive species in our garden. Share what you know with others. You guys are now informed. Go and talk to your friends, your neighbors, your relatives, and tell them what you've learned here and get them, get them concerned too. Inform your local representatives about plant conservation issues, and you'll find out about a lot of the plant conservation issues by joining WNPS, the Native Plant Society. Um, but make sure that they know that this is one of your concerns, that plant conservation is important to you. You're not plant blind. You see them. And support conservation organizations and their budgets. This is a tight time economically for all of us, and conservation organizations are really uh, hurting, and so they really need your support, and including us. Um, and so I just wanted to point out, as, as Dean Baer had said, uh, we are supported by a number of charitable foundations. This is just a few of them. The Miller Foundation, the Fish and Wildlife Foundation, Bullet, Ferguson, Mountaineers, the Seattle to Tacoma Garden Clubs have all been extremely generous. Um, private organizations and individual donors, many of you are in the room. We so appreciate your support. It's a little known fact that the University of Washington contributes my salary. Um, the office and the telephone for rare care, as well as some supplies and small equipment. But the salaries of the staff, the maps that we use, the postage, all of that comes from donations and from grants from organizations. So it is, it's critical to, to our work and all the work that you just heard me talk about that we get this kind of support. Okay, you may be feeling a little overwhelmed, a little depressed maybe. So I thought I'd leave you with some pretty plant pictures. And also this quote. So a few years ago, my husband gave me one of those quote a day calendar things where you tear it off. And, and most of the quotes were kind of like, yeah. But this one really struck with me. Um, uh, Striving for excellence motivates you. Striving for perfection demoralizes. And this is by Harriet Breaker, who turns out is actually a psychiatrist who write, or she's deceased now, but she wrote uh, self-help books for stressed out and overworked women. So um, <laughs> it's probably why it resonated so much with me. But what this, and I, I, it's almost become my mantra. I tore it off and I stuck it on the bulletin board over my desk. But it reminds us that we are not going to win all of the battles. And we can't focus on that. We have to focus on the positive things. We have to focus on the successes that we've had and work like heck to have more successes. But we can't get focused in on our failures. We always need to be looking towards the positive and striving for excellence, but forgiving ourselves if we're not perfect in solving every plant and every population and every species. Although. I'll be kind of bummed if we don't save every species. But, um, and you know what? The most important thing to me, the most positive thing that I have, have seen or heard in rare plant conservation in a long time is that all of you came out on a cold winter night to learn about rare plants. And I thank you.